Um, it is a great pleasure to have you all here, uh, to welcome you to our event. This event is, as you know, organized by CISAC, the International Confederation of Authors Societies. CISAC has 230 societies, member societies from 120 countries. So I assume we have a, a society in all, or in most of the countries here in the room. Our societies together represent over 3 million creators, 3 million creators from all artistic disciplines, so music, audiovisual, visual arts, literature, and drama. Sizak and WIPO always enjoyed strong ties, and this is because of the central role that WIPO plays in shaping international laws in the area of copyright. The Standing of Committee on Copyright here at WIPO is charged with the development of international copyright policies, and the decisions of this committee affect and impact first and foremost on the creators, the creators that rely on copyright to make a living. However, it is very rare that the voice of the creators is heard in this committee. It is very rare that the voice of creators is present here in WIPO. So today, we wanted to give the floor to them. We wanted to give the floor to the creators. We wanted to give them the opportunity to speak, and we wanted to give you the opportunity to ask them questions, to hear from the creators directly about their views, their thoughts uh, on the current agenda of WIPO in the area of copyright, and what can be done here, how this forum can be used to, um, to secure the future of creators, creativity, and culture. So the authors who joined us today come from different parts of the world, and they are active in different <coughs> creative fields. We are grateful to them that they have accepted our invitation and came here to speak before you. And uh, without further ado, let me pass the floor to our moderator, Tom Burgess Watson, who will be our host for the next hour and a half. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that introduction, uh, Gaddy, uh, Gaddy Oren, who is, of course, the uh, Director General of CZAC. Uh, and thank you very much indeed for having me here today. Uh, my job is to uh, moderate a discussion during the course of the next 90 minutes. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Tom Burgess Watson. Uh, I'm more typically used to sitting in a news studio looking at cameras, uh, reading the television news in France, which I do every evening. I'm less used to seeing people staring back at me, but it's very nice to know that you're there. Um, moderating conferences is also something I do uh, quite often, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, for this panel, which is entitled A Sustainable Future for Authors. Uh, what we want to establish is how uh, can creators survive in what is a rapidly changing environment? Uh, how are they supposed to be incentivized uh, to keep on creating uh, when the goalposts are constantly shifting? If you think about the way in which we access our films, our music, our television dramas, books, it's changed enormously uh, during the last few years, and so has the model for remunerating the creators of those things. So what can we do to stay abreast of those changes? And who can play what part in steering the creative sector in such a way that it's best positioned to turn any threat into a great opportunity? We have uh, some pretty broad topics to discuss today. We've got very little time. Um, you'll all have your chance uh, to get involved. We will ask you uh, we will put the floor, uh, the questions to the floor at some stage in just a short while. But let's get on with the uh, panel discussion. I'd like to start by introducing uh, the six panelists who are here with me today. Uh, let me start uh, in order of who's going to speak first, because each one is going to make a statement uh, after this. Uh, to my left is uh, Jean-Michel Jarre, and I'm sure uh, hardly anybody on earth hasn't at some stage uh, heard your music. And uh, you're, of course, a composer and a performer, uh, but you're also uh, the president of CISAC. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, Angèle Diabang, you're at the far right uh, of, the, of the table there. Uh, you're a film director and producer. You're also the chair of the board 
of the new Senegalese Copyright Society. Thank you for coming uh, all this way to join us as well. Uh, Hervé Di Rosa is sitting, where are you? There. Oh, you're there, you're hiding. Um, a visual artist and a painter. Uh, he's celebrated in the free figuration movement and he's also the vice president of the French Visual Arts Society, uh, known by its acronym uh, ADAGP, or ADAGP. I'm also joined by Vinod Rang Ranganat, who is sitting on the far left over there, uh, who has uh, created some of India's most loved television dramas, and he's also the founding member of India's new audiovisual society. Sitting in the middle here, between these two gentlemen, is Daphne Levin, who is a screenwriter and a director. She's the brains behind a number of award-winning TV series and commercials in Israel. Thank you to you. And last but not least, here to my right, is Eddie Schwartz, a songwriter and record producer, who's written dozens of hit songs from his base in Nashville. Uh, he participates in numerous bodies and amongst them, he's the co-chair of Music Creators North America. Thank you very much indeed to you, Eddie. Uh, each is going to speak for a few moments, uh, give a short statement, and I'd like to start with you, uh, Jean-Michel Jarre. Thank you. Uh, is it working? Yes. yes. OK, thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, as you just heard, CISAC is a global organization that represents author societies around the world. We represent more than th three, million, three million creators, music composers, like me, lyricists, film directors, scriptwriters, painters, photographers, and many other creative people. We like to see ourselves as the United Nations of creators. We don't have a security council, and I'm sure that we have less committees than WIPO does, but we unite creators from every corner of the world, and we have an army of creators who are ready to fight and protect their rights to live from their creation. CISAC is a truly unique organization for many reasons. One, it is a multi-repertoire. We represent creators in the fields of audiovisual, music, literature, and visual arts. Number two, it is the, the only global organization of this kind. It has members in almost every country. We are truly global. Three, and we stand for something that is vital to us creators, the defense of our rights. The session today is about how we can all together build a sustainable future for creators and copyright. And I believe that you, the decision makers, have a key role to play. So let's start with the beginning, how we can all together build a sustainable future for creators and copyright. And I believe that you, the decision makers, have a key role to play, as I said. And let's remember that from Plateau to JK Rowling, from Beethoven to Kanye West, from Garcia Marquez to Wong Kar Wai, from Rembrandt to Picasso, from Charlie Chaplin to Steven Spielberg, great works of art have survived the test of time. They are fully part of our culture, of our DNA. They define who we are. They shape the society we live in. Creation enriches our lives intellectually, sometimes spiritually. And let's not forget Creation also plays an important role economically. We, the creators, make an impact on each and every country's economy. Creators do not live in a vacuum. To get our creative works across, we are partnering with, with what can be described as the creative industries. Record labels, film producers, publishers, broadcasters, art galleries, or auction houses. But we are, many times, are at the mercy of the people who control the channels of distribution to our works. This is especially in today's digital ecosystem. I cannot stress this enough, and although I'm sure you know it, I will say it, we are the most vulnerable element in this ecosystem. 
the system that brings to all of you our music, films, book, and paintings. Creating a work of art, be it a painting, a song, a movie, or a book, requires talent and lots of time. But it is mostly a solitary process. Creators usually work alone. But we need and we depend on others in order to make a living form our creation. This is why organizations such as Authors Societies and CISAC are so important to us. We need them to take care of our interests. That's why combining our strength via societies that represent us and protect our works is so crucial. The role of creators in society and the importance of our societies as our representatives have taken a new dimension with the advent of the digital revolution. With the development of digital technologies and the major online services that we have today, something went wrong. Suddenly, creators were seen as anti-technology. Let me say it loud and clear. We are pro-technology. We embrace it and we have no problems with it. Wider access to culture is made possible thanks to innovative new digital services and devices. We, wel we welcome that. Creators have been at the forefront of the digital revolution. After all, digital content is mainly our creation. And we obviously welcome the possibility for our works to reach large audiences. We are also open and receptive to new business models, obviously, and, but we need models that are economically viable and sustainable. We need business models that make sense to all parties. They should take into account the interesting value of creative works and they must be based on a fair remuneration for creators. Creators are at the center of the digital economy. It's, it is our work that generates so much revenues for digital services. So is it too much asking that we get a fair share of this business? We need digital services as much as they need the creative content that we provide them with. We are happy to sit alongside all these brilliant companies that are transforming today's global economy and see how we can build this sustainable future together. But it has to be done through mutual respect. And we need you, the governments, to make it happen. Because at the moment, it does not. Our art, our, our art is our life, livelihood. We need you, the decision makers, to give us the means in all your countries to reap the promises of digital technology by ensuring creators can make a decent living from their works. So, now is the time to look at how we are going to remunerate creators in the future. We have a lot to explore. First, we need to see how creators can get their share in the huge revenues that major technology companies make from providing access to our content. Free access to the consumer should not mean that the creator is not paid. At the end of the day, someone is making a lot of money from providing access to our works and we are entitled to a share in that. We also need to ensure that creators have rights to apply to digital use of their works. In each and every country of the world, creators from one country should not be deprived of opportunities that exist in another country. We also need to ensure that creator, creators are compensated for all acts that involve exploitation of their works, including private copying, for example. This is another important thing, especially in emerging economies. And ensuring that creators have operational societies that represent them collectively is hugely important. Because as I said, we are the core part of the creative industries, but we cannot protect ourselves individually. We need to group, work collectively under one roof 
under one organization that represents us and protects our interests. One principle should guide us. Sustainable creative sectors can only thrive if those at the art of the creative process, the creators, receive fair remuneration for the use and the exploitation of their works. And we need you, policymakers, to ensure that this is going to happen. <clears throat> so my message to you today is the following. Let's roll up our sleeves and start working on this economically viable and sustainable future. Creators, our commercial partners, the people who finance us or invest in us, the societies that protect our rights, internet companies and other factors of the digital economy, and you, the policy makers, from each government to organizations like WIPO. We need to start now in a dialogue which has fairness as its core. We need to develop a new agenda, as I said last night, an agenda of creativity for development, which focuses on how we can reap the benefits of creativity to support cultural and economic growth. This is our chance, and this is also our responsibility towards the future generations for our children. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jean-Michel Jarre, uh, for sharing that with us. Um, let's go to the other end of the panel now, and we can hear from Angèle Diabong, who is a film director and producer. Uh, Angèle, let me pass over to you. Bonjour à tout le monde. Moi, je suis euh, très contente d'être ici pour la première fois à Lompi aujourd'hui. Et je voudrais d'abord commencer par remercier la CISAC euh, qui a organisé, qui a eu l'initiative de, euh, de ce panel qui regroupe euh, des créateurs de différents euh, pays du monde. Et euh, je vous remercie aussi d'avoir pensé au Sénégal pour participer à, à, à ce panel-là. Et euh, nous, au Sénégal, nous sommes à un moment important. Euh, euh, dans la lutte des, de la défense des propriétés intellectuelles. Euh, il y a une dizaine d'années, un groupe d'artistes se sont regroupés et ont pensé qu'il fallait modifier la loi pour faire évoluer euh, le travail du Bureau des droits d'auteur qui était là depuis les années 70. Et ces artistes ont participé à créer une nouvelle loi qui a été votée en 2008. Mais depuis 2008, il n'y a pas eu application de cette loi. Et euh, c'est seulement en décembre dernier, en décembre 2013, qui a eu une grande assemblée euh, générale à Dakar. Et euh, près de 700 artistes sont venus de tout le Sénégal. Euh, C'était très symbolique. Et euh, on était ensemble de 14h au petit matin, d'abord pour élire le conseil d'administration, mais discuter des statuts et revoir euh, toutes les questions qui étaient liées à la nouvelle société de, de gestion collective. Euh, et puis donc moi, j'ai été élu en mars. Et depuis, on a commencé à vraiment... Euh, mettre en pratique cette nouvelle loi-là qui va prendre en charge maintenant les droits voisins, la copie privée, le droit de suite et la rémunération équitable. Ce qui est euh, très important pour les créateurs sénégalais parce que jusque-là, les répartitions euh, n'étaient pas, on va dire, efficaces. Euh, maintenant, nous voulons une collecte et une répartition plus efficaces mais, mais aussi assez transparentes et euh, surtout un système de rémunération juste et équitable. Donc, euh, nous allons nous appuyer sur des sociétés d'auteurs et des institutions qui existent déjà, comme la CISAC ou l'AMPI, des grandes sociétés d'autres pays, comme la SACD, euh, pour euh, prendre exemple dans leur cadre de, de travail et avancer justement pour que les, euh, les créateurs sénégalais puissent vivre de leur, de leur art euh, mais aussi sensibiliser, commencer par une sensibilisation, pas seulement des artistes, pas seulement des chaînes de télévision, pas seulement des institutions culturelles, mais aussi des magistrats, euh, dans les lycées, dans les écoles et toute la population sénégalaise, pour qu'ils qu soient conscients tout simplement de ce qu'est le droit d'auteur et qu'ils sachent qu'un artiste qui travaille et qu'on utilise son œuvre gratuitement, ça a un impact sur toute l'économie du pays. Parce que si un artiste peut vivre de son art, il peut créer des œuvres plus solides et ça a aussi un impact sur l'économie du, du, du Sénégal. Donc euh, voilà un peu ce que je vais dire pour commencer et on continuera la discussion tout à l'heure. Thank you very much indeed uh, to you again, Angèle Diabong. 
Uh, let me pass now to Hervé de Rosa, who uh, would also Je like to make là, a statement. Merci. Bon, mais, uh, merci à tous. Je vais parler en français par, par amitié francophone avec le Sénégal. Et puis on va utiliser les, les traducteurs, parce que les, les traducteurs, c'est comme la culture. Le jour où on s'apercevra qu'on en a qu'on n'en a plus, c'est là où on en aura le plus besoin. Voilà, moi je suis un artiste, peintre, c'est plus facile en anglais, on dit visual artiste. J'utilise aussi bien les techniques ancestrales que le, les, les programmes numériques graphiques. Euh, on entend beaucoup parler euh, du marché de l'art dans les médias, euh, même les non-spécialistes de l'art contemporain, qui souvent paraît un terme euh, barbare, euh, savent à travers les médias les, les chiffres records que certaines œuvres d'artistes vivants atteignent euh, ces derniers temps. Euh, il faut dire que ce n'est pas pour tous les artistes comme ça, qu'il y a très très peu d'artistes et que 10% des, des artistes perçoivent à peu près 95% des revenus du marché de l'art. On sait aussi qu'en Suisse, euh, la plus grande foire d'art contemporain existe à Bâle. On sait ici aussi qu'à Genève, vous avez une zone franche où des centaines de containers sont remplis de milliers d'œuvres d'art. Euh, et on sait aussi que euh, les artistes doivent vivre. Alors c'est vrai que, pourquoi je m'implique là-dedans Parce que j'ai la chance de pouvoir, euh, depuis que j'ai 20 ans, depuis 35 ans, vivre correctement de, de mon travail. Et je me suis aperçu, euh, dans mes voyages, mes, pour mes expositions, euh, que beaucoup d'artistes n'étaient pas dans ce cas, et que beaucoup d'artistes euh, très intéressants, importants, avaient des problèmes de survie, arrivaient difficilement à vivre. Euh, donc j'ai décidé euh, qu'un artiste qui arrive à vivre son travail doit aussi essayer de faire autre chose. C'est pour ça que je me suis engagé avec la DAGP bon, à plusieurs années. La DAGP, c'est la Société de droit d'auteur française dont je suis vice-président. Je suis aussi président du CIAGP, qui est un organisme à l'intérieur de la CISAC qui regroupe toutes les sociétés, les 60 sociétés de droit d'auteur pour les artistes graphiques, illustrateurs et, et photographes. Et je suis aussi président de musée dans le sud de la France, à Sète, ma ville natale, qui euh, étudie les rapports entre les arts populaires et l'art contemporain. Voilà pourquoi je, je suis là aujourd'hui. La DAGP a été une des premières sociétés, je pense même la première, à défendre le fameux droit de suite dont je vais vous parler, le « resell right ». Parce que nous avons aussi, euh, dans l'art visuel, des problèmes avec l'économie numérique, mais je pense que l'audiovisuel et la musique, mes confrères, ont beaucoup plus de choses à dire là-dessus et leurs problèmes sont beaucoup plus pointus et aigus que les nôtres. Euh, le resale right, le droit de suite, c'est quoi C'est euh, comment essayer de redistribuer un peu euh, les plus-values parfois énormes qui sont euh, réalisées sur les ventes, les reventes d'œuvres d'art qui, qui passent de main en main euh, au cours des, des, des années et au cours des siècles. Moi, je vois ma petite expérience, il y a des œuvres qui, que j'ai faites au début des années 80 qui ont dû avoir au moins 20 ou 30 euh, possesseurs, vous voyez ça. Et comment euh, redistribuer cet argent Alors, il y a eu une... Euh, L'idée du droit de suite vient d'une petite anecdote. Vous connaissez tous l'Angélus de, de Millet, ce célèbre tableau, fait à la fin du 19e siècle, et qui est passé en vente au début, euh, dans les années 20, je crois, au début du 20e siècle, et qui est un des premiers tableaux à avoir atteint une somme record à cette époque-là, pour, pour une œuvre qui était presque contemporaine, hein, à ce moment-là. Et on s'apercevait dans le même temps que la famille, que le Millet, bien sûr, étant, était décédé, et sa famille, sa veuve et ses enfants vivaient dans la misère la plus noire. Et un dessin de Forain, qui est le célèbre illustrateur du début du XXe siècle, avait fait un dessin, justement, où on voyait ces, ces enfants très pauvres dans la rue l'hiver, regarder à travers la vitrine d'une grande galerie d'art avenue Matignon, une peinture qui était avec un prix absolument incroyable, et l'enfant disait à son frère, tu vois, c'est papa qui l'a peint. Donc cette, cette histoire a beaucoup sensibilisé les gens là-dessus, et donc ce droit de suite... Euh, répartit, euh, récupère un tout petit pourcentage, on parle de 3%, euh, on parle aussi d'une somme plafonnée à 15 000 euros, donc vous voyez, les, ceux qui vendent des, des œuvres à plusieurs millions, euh, ce n'est pas un pourcentage énorme qui grève leurs leur, leur, leur bénéfices. Et puis, depuis 2001, euh, cette, cette directive a été, cette loi est, par une directive européenne a été étendue à tous les pays d'Europe, et euh, donc depuis 2001, le droit de suite peut être euh, récupéré dans tous les pays d'Europe. Voilà, donc là, depuis une dizaine, depuis donc, euh, oui, 15 ans, 
nous avons pu, et là je vais prendre quelques chiffres, nous avons pu voir un peu, étudier euh, l'impact sur le marché de l'art. Parce que bien sûr, le problème, je pense comme dans l'économie numérique aussi, c'est que les, les, les commerçants du marché de l'art, dont nous avons besoin, hein, moi je travaille bien sûr avec les galeries et les maisons de vente, euh, pensaient que c'était une taxe supplémentaire et que ça allait perturber le marché en Europe et que ce marché allait se replier sur les états unis ou l'Asie. Euh, sur l'Asie, non, parce qu'il y a de, de, de grandes taxes sur les œuvres d'art en Chine, par exemple, qui est considérée comme, une, comme un produit de luxe. Et donc, après euh, plus de dix ans de, de, du droit de suite effectif, euh, les estimations euh, des droits de suite, en fait, représentent 0,3% du marché de l'art en Europe. Donc, vous voyez, c'est quand même des, des sommes qui sont très, très périphériques. D'autre part, cette loi a eu un impact vraiment fondamental sur la communauté des créateurs en permettant de redistribuer des millions d'euros qui tout simplement n'existaient pas auparavant. Et pourquoi cette, cette directive, cette loi peut s'appliquer Parce qu'il existe des sociétés de droit d'auteur qui savent effectivement répartir de manière équitable ces sommes-là à leurs artistes. On disait aussi que le droit de suite ne, bénéficie, ne bénéficierait qu'on anti oh, à ces célèbres 10% d'artistes qui captent 95% des fruits du marché. Et euh, donc on s'est aperçu, et les chiffres représentés par les sociétés d'auteurs françaises et britanniques lors de la consultation de 2011 ont montré, ont montré qu'au contraire, le droit de suite a bénéficié à tout un ensemble d'artistes beaucoup plus large qu'initialement envisagé. Donc vous voyez, euh, c'est... Euh, après euh, plus de dix ans de pratique de ce droit de suite en Europe, on s'aperçoit d'une part des effets bénéfiques pour la communauté artistique et d'autre part euh, du peu d'impact sur les bénéfices commerciaux des entreprises de maisons de vente et de galeries. Alors aujourd'hui, je suis heureux d'être euh, ici, euh, parce que c'est rare quand les artistes sont, euh, sont à l'OMPI au WIPO, euh, et surtout que depuis euh, un an ou deux, je sais que... Euh, les, euh, des pays ont, ont justement le, le, la récente réunion du Standing Committee euh, on Copyright ici, avec en particulier des apports en faveur du droit de suite provenant de pays comme le Sénégal, le Congo, le Maroc ou l'Inde, des pays où la production artistique est exceptionnelle mais dont les créateurs ne bénéficient pas toujours, pour ainsi dire rarement, hein, des protections que nous avons euh, dans l'Union Européenne. Donc nous avons envie, euh, nous devons aujourd'hui, et c'est pour ça que je suis ici, essayer de de vous convaincre pour mettre en place à un niveau mondial un outil qui permettra aux créateurs de tous les pays de bénéficier d'un système simple et efficace de redistribution des flux économiques générés par le marché de l'art. Euh, nous avons besoin de l'art, mais nous avons également besoin d'une communauté artistique bénéficiant de droits équitables. Parce que comme on dit toujours, euh, à quoi sert l'art hein, euh, euh, on, peut, on peut difficilement le dire, mais par contre, quand il n'est plus là, quand l'art et la culture ne sont plus là, là, on voit le, le gouffre et les problèmes sociaux et culturels que tout ça provoque. Voilà, donc je vous demande aujourd'hui d'essayer de donner à ces artistes des outils qui leur permettront de créer dans un cadre juridique plus juste et plus respectueux de leurs droits. Et je, donc, et je vous demande à vous, les représentants de la communauté internationale, regroupés au sein de l'OMPI, de prendre cette question à bras le corps, elle est très importante, et de nous donner, via un traité, cet outil en faveur d'une économie de la création équitable et durable dans le secteur des arts visuels. Si nous y arrivons, ce sera une avancée dont la communauté mondiale pourra s'énorgueillir. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much indeed for that, Hervé, Hervé Di Rosa. Uh, let me now pass to the gentleman at the far end of the table, Vinod Ranganat. Uh, please. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, okay. Good afternoon. My name is Vinod Ranganat. I've been a scriptwriter and a playwright in India for over 20 years. And I began my career writing the first daily soap in India, which I co wrote with a well known journalist and novelist by the name of Shobha Day. And since then, I've written quite a lot of uh, television series and feature films and plays, and I've also directed them. Now, I come from a land which conjures a lot of images for a lot of people, right from snake charmers to elephants and God knows what have you. But there are some interesting facts about India. 
which I would like to share with you. India is a country of 1.2 billion people, which translates to four times the size of the USA, 30 times the size of Canada, and 55 times the size of Australia. So you can imagine what a big market it is. We have 29 official languages and about 500 official dialects. We also have about 5,500 year old tradition and civilization with rich heritage of various narrative traditions of myths, epics, folklores, and a wide spectrum of ancient storytelling. What this translated into? This has translated into India making 1,200 feature films a year, which is the highest in the world. And we have today close to 1,000 satellite terrestrial cable channels. Now, when you look at a situation like this, any author in any part of the world would be thinking, wow, this is a great place to be, and here's where I make my career. <laughs> Unfortunately, that has never been the case with us authors in India. What was our situation? Our situation was that we would pass on all our copyright to the producer, to the broadcaster, and we would get nothing in return. In other words, my creative input, the writing that was turned into films or TV programs did not yield any copyright for me. And this continued for over 100 years. And I say 100 years because we just celebrated 100 years of Indian cinema a couple of years back. Thankfully, the situation changed. A couple of years back, to be precise, 2012, June, under pressure from authors like us, and especially by a very well-known author from India, Mr. Javed Akhtar, who happens to be the Vice President of CISAC, the government finally yielded and amended the Copyright Act. But this was a great victory for us. The, there were two main points to that amendment, which was what has to be noted. One is that you assign your copyright to the producer, but you are not assigning your royalties. Royalties are inalienable in India today, as per the amendment. The only way where we can assign royalties are to the legal heir and to the collective management organization, the CMO. Now, this was a great victory for us. So what it means is that any attempt on the part of the broadcaster or the film producer to get any contract whereby you are forced to sign off your royalties becomes illegal in India since 2012 June. But like all such changes, this change was also not accepted by the industry and especially the powerful media barons that we have in India. And this is just for all of you to know that the biggest networks and broadcasters in India happen to be all American. We have, we have Fox, we have Sony, we have Viacom 18, we have Warner, we have Disney. These are the biggest broadcasters in India, apart from two homegrown uh, networks, which is Sun TV and ZTV. Now, what did they do? They got together under an umbrella organization called the Indian Broadcasting Foundation, the IBF. And they, last year in November, challenged the writ. They filed a writ in the Bombay High Court and they have challenged the amendments. Their claim is that it is the government didn't understand the business of television broadcasting. And so this amendment is going to hit their business. Now, what we did was that we quickly the authors in India got together and formed a national solidarity front for television, film writers, and lyricists. This is just for your knowledge. India has close to between 15 to 18,000 script writers registered in six guilds. So we came together in February of this year and we formed a national front. And we decided to be a party to this writ petition whereby we are holding hands with the government and we are saying that we are interested party and we are spending millions of Indian rupees fighting this cause. So, though the act has changed and the act says that today all royalties have to be collected by a CMO, 
we are in the process of forming India's first CMO. And the CMO right now is called SCRIPT, which stands for Society for Copyright and Indian Intellectual Property Rights. It's been tough trying to set up the CMO right now because we are hoping that this uh, tentatively titled script uh, will be accepted by the Registrar of Societies. The launch of script will be an important step for us and we will have to set rates and then get them ratified by the Copyright Society of India. And then we have to establish contractual relations with broadcasters, producers and eventually collect and redistribute the rights owned to creators. For me, a CMO is the answer to the need to assert the rights of individual creators. I can always try to deal directly with studios and broadcasters like some other big uh, authors in India individually have gone and done their deals. But what do you think will be the outcome of this whole thing? Do you think that the broadcasters will allow a CMO like script to be formed in India? I would like to conclude by saying that the power of the collective is the way to ensure that we can build a fair and sustainable system for creators. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Vinod, Vinod uh, Ranganat, for that. Let me now pass to you, uh, Vinod's neighbor, Daphne Levin. Uh, tell us about the situation uh, where you're from. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Daphna Levine. I'm a director and scriptwriter from Israel. I have been working, uh, writing uh, TV series and uh, commercials for the past 20 years. Um, I'm a freelancer. That means that I pitch my ideas to uh, um, production companies and then broadcasters, hoping that they will evolve into TV shows, finally. Believe it or not, it actually happened once or twice before. So, um, the situation in Israel is uh, somewhat similar to the one in uh, India or uh, Senegal, but uh, different because we do have a society operating in Israel since uh, 10 years ago. Um, uh, uh, the, the, our society is called Tali, and it was uh, before it was uh, it existed the streams of uh, royalties going back to the creators were practically non-existent. Uh, we were too weak negotiating our agreements and also we could not negotiate our agreements with each and every broadcaster or, users or user of our works. Uh, it's impossible to do that and it's even more impossible to monitor the use of our works. Uh, someone has to do it professionally, we couldn't do it on our own. So the coming into life of our society changed that. First of all, our society made agreements with TV channels, including satellite and cable channels. It made agreements with uh, phone operators and even airline companies. Uh, so now we receive royalties uh, for any use of our uh, perform uh, public performance of our works. And uh, because they monitor the broadcasting that we get uh, royalties accordingly to, uh, to uh, broadcasting. Um, the other thing that Tali did for us was uh, help foster the uh, perception that uh, writing is an actual profession, a real trade. And uh, this is very important to us because before that, I don't think uh, the uh, broadcasters have even, uh, you know, nobody has given any thought to that, uh, to the, the the work that we do uh, even before we go to the broadcasters. Um, so in Israel, we are lucky to have a society representing us, but uh, lately it is been under threat of existence because the um, competition authority uh, is not convinced that the screenwriters uh, society is uh, the coll collective uh, management uh, organization is uh, necessary. They think uh, that the producers and uh, TV channels can uh, uh, take care of the interests of the creators, which is, of course, absurd. It's like uh, we say in Hebrew, it's like letting the cat guard the cream. It's no way it's going to work. So um, 
uh, many of my peers have been extremely vocal in challenging the plans from the comp uh, competition authorities. Uh, interestingly, the media, and including some leading uh, daily newspapers, stood by Tali and by the creators, and we received a lot of uh, sympathy from the public. The international, and this is important to you guys, the international community has stepped in, uh, especially through CSEC, which uh, demonstrated that the system wasn't the, the CMO system was in place in Europe and many other parts of the world, and that there had been no such precedent of a competition body uh, uh, challenging the validity of such an organization. This has made a great difference. Uh, our government is no longer dealing with uh, a local problem, it's dealing with uh, an international issue, and this is important to us because we feel that uh, the, the international community has taken notice of our situation and that they are supporting us. So all these efforts uh, were somewhat fruitful. The competition authority didn't change their mind, but the atmosphere, the environment has changed. And so uh, the case is now uh, brought before the antitrust tribunal, and we hope that our views will prevail. Uh, to us, this is a step in the right direction. We need fully operational society. We need our rights as creators to be protected and enforced. What is happening, what might happen to our society if it shuts down is, it means going back to middle, middle ages where uh, 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 the broadcasters being the lords and the creators being the subjects. So I'm asking you, members of WIPO, to, uh, to use your power and to use your um, resources to assist directors and screenwriters, make sure that they have effective rights that allow them to obtain remuneration when their films and TV series are used help them to organize themselves in a society that, is collectively, that can collectively represent them against the powerful commercial entities that uh, use their work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you very much indeed, Daphne Levin there. And last but not least, uh, a perspective from North America, Eddie Schwartz. Thank you, Tom. Um, let me start by uh, saying that uh, I'd like to thank both WIPO and CZAC for this opportunity as a music creator to speak directly to those of you in the room today who uh, have so much power to make the situation for music creators around the world better than it is today. Um, I frankly am tempted just to ask uh, Jean-Michel to pass his speech down here so I can read it again. Um, but. Um, rather than do that, because I think he, he touched on so many of the crucial issues that face us. Rather than do that, um, as, as probably good as it would be, although I think he probably would still do it better than I could do it, um, I think maybe I'll drill down into some of the specific issues that uh, have been touched on, again, specifically by uh, Jean-Michel, um, and give you some, some kind of hard numbers um, about the situation that music creators in particular face these days. Although I am a Canadian, songwriter, was born and raised in Toronto. Uh, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, which is the last city in North America that actually can sustain the music industry. It's a relatively small city. It's called Music City USA for any of you uh, who have been there and for those of you who haven't as well. Um, and uh, I was informed by one of the, the larger songwriting organizations there in recent times that the number of, of people who can make a living writing songs in Music City, USA has decreased by 80%. So eight in 10 folks who made their living as songwriters in the last, up until recent days, no longer can do so. So I think that gives you some indication uh, of the dire situation that music creators are in, uh, in, in what I think is also arguably the biggest uh, and most lucrative market in the world. So um, uh, again, to echo uh, one of the, um, the comments that Jean-Michel made before I get into some of the specifics that I'd like to share with you. Um, the, uh, the technology is marvelous. And I think, that, again, that, that perception that we are against technology, uh, I, I, again, I want to emphasize, I push back on that as Jean-Michel did. 
we, we embrace technology. We, we, I've been using computers since the early 80s. I had one of the first, you know, Apple computers ever made. Technology is marvelous. It's allowed us, it's been a tremendous tool for creators. And of course, we now have uh, something that's remarkable, I think, in the history of the world, where you have creators in every country in the world, in every continent, have exactly the same access, which is almost virtually instant access, to markets everywhere in the world that was only restricted to probably North American and perhaps European uh, songwriters and music creators, uh, uh, you know, for, 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 the, for the duration uh, of uh, the music industry. So now, again, you know, if you write a song anywhere in the world, in Africa or Asia or, or um, Latin or South America, you have instant access to the world's markets. I think that's a remarkable and very welcome development. But I guess the question that faces us here and that, and that we, we need your help for is with that marvelous technology, if the music itself is valued at zero or so close to zero as to be indistinguishable from zero, to what advantage is that incredible uh, access to the markets? I mean, it's a deeply ironic and not a happy irony that, uh, that we face ourselves in that situation. So having said that, let me, let me get back, let me drill, drill down to some of those figures that I, I said I would. Um, as a songwriter, I've been very fortunate. Uh, and so um, I've written uh, songs for people like Joe Cocker, who's recorded three of my songs, the Doobie Brothers, who've done four of my songs, Pat Benatar, Donna Summer, Carly Simon, Meatloaf. For those of you who are country and, and Western fans, although I don't see too many cowboy hats in the audience uh, today. Uh, Rascal Flatts and Martina McBride have recorded my songs. So um, thanks to uh, these marvelous artists, and, and, and there are others who have recorded my songs, I get uh, statements that, have, that are uh, pretty specifically show me my revenue streams as, as they exist now in the digital universe we live in. So to start off with a reference point, because I think uh, th this will be helpful, um, in the analog uh, physical product world, which we left behind, you know, maybe somewhere between, let's say, five years ago, um, if one of my songs was on one of these wonderful artists' records and it sold a million copies, uh, somewhere down the road, I would receive something like 45,000 US dollars on a million sales. So let's talk about a million sales. A million sales was su such a, a, a unique. Uh, under, you know, uh, um, occurrence in, the, in those days that I would get a, a platinum record. I'm sure you've all seen those wonderful big platinum records. Well, I would get one of those because a million's a lot of sales in the music industry. And I think we can also agree, and especially from a North American perspective, that $45,000, I didn't become a rich person. I had, I, I was at that point $45,000. If I did my job right, if a, if a known artist did one of my songs, uh, I would receive what amounted to a, an okay middle class income. And I was fine with that because I never expected to make any money in the music business. I just did it because I couldn't do anything else. It was something that I loved and I had to pursue. But the good news was I, was I could do nothing but make music. I could dedicate my life to the creation of my art and support myself in a modest but fine way. So let me contrast that with what a million streams on, on the major digital services pay a songwriter today. So you're gonna have to bear with me here. So uh, um, uh, one stream, we'll start with one stream and then we'll, we'll do some simple arithmetic. So one stream on my statements that I get from Sony ATV, which is one of the ma world's major music publishers, is point, decimal point, zero, 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 zero. Still with me? Three, five. Okay, zero point, decimal point, zero, 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 four zeros, three, five. I happen to know that scientists now are, are uh, in uh, tunnels underground, smashing things together to see if they can find something that small. <laughs> I think they're actually colliding uh, accountants at the speed of light to see if they can. All right, so a million streams, and again, thanks to some of these artists, I, I do see things of that kind, nature, pays me the incredible amount of money of $35. A million times that is $35. So I've gone from 45,000 $45, US dollars a year for that kind of activity down to a pizza. Now I could probably get the 
anchovies and the pepperoni, but it's still a pizza. So we're talking about, for all intents and purposes, a 100% drop in revenue. I mean, if, if I was making 10%, I'd be making 4,500 a year. If I was making 1%, I'd be getting $450, or um, yeah, $450. Instead, I'm getting less than, I don't even know. But it, it's really, it, in fact, it's such a small amount that some of the intermediaries in the value chain round it down to zero. They don't even send me, they don't even bother sending me a check. They say, when you get to $50, we'll send you a check. When you get to $100, we'll send you a check. Good luck with that. So, um, and I must, and, I, and, and I, I don't want to put ourselves in an adversarial position with the streaming services because, again, as Jean-Michel said and others, I love, the, I love the technology. I love the instant access. People should have access to music. We're not, that's not the debate. But uh, the CEO one of one of the biggest streaming services uh, in the world, whose name that you all know but I won't mention, uh, in recent months gave themselves a, a, a bonus of $15 million. So I would need, in fact, I don't know that I think you, uh, I don't know that any artist in the world, you think of the biggest artists who ever existed, their entire catalogs have never earned on streaming services, anything like $15 million. For, for, uh, for me to make that kind of money on the streaming service, I would need every person on earth, plus every person on worlds unknown, plus galaxies we haven't been to and may never go to, and other dimensions. All of them would have to stream my music at, at the rate that we have now before I could probably get to a tenth or a fifteenth of what the CEO of this particular streaming service paid themselves in recent days. That wasn't their salary, that was their bonus. So let me conclude, I know we want to get to a general discussion, but let me conclude by saying a few words about a study that a Music Creators North America with the help of CM. CM is the Authors Council uh, within CZAC, which I am on the executive committee of. Um, let me say a few words about this, this study that we have undertaken, which is now completed. Uh, it's, um, it's called The Study Concerning Fair Compensation for Music Creators in the Digital Age. Uh, it, it was done in English by a, uh, a Canadian economist by the name of Pierre Lalonde, who worked for the Copyright Board of Canada and also for Heritage Department of the Canadian Government, which is the cultural, the, the department that oversees culture. It will be translated into French and Spanish. Uh, so let me, let me quote from that study. While most musicians and songwriters don't dedicate themselves to music for money, the simple truth is they can't make music without it. The sustainability of creativity depends on the recognition of the intrinsic financial value that musical works bring to so many businesses. This can only, and, uh, so many businesses, this can only be achieved through fair compensation to the songwriters and performances after all, these services wouldn't exist without the music itself. So we are all, you know, mesmerized by these technologies, but I think it is up to many of you in this room to start to implement laws and policies that ensure that technologies serve a greater good, that the technologies aren't an end, an end in themselves, uh, but they serve the purpose of all humanity, which is the creation and the value of our culture. I think we would all agree that our culture is invaluable. So how can it be that in, using the, these current technologies and these uh, services, it is, it is so denigrated in terms of its value? Uh, we must use copyright and author's rights and other legal tools to ensure that our wonderful cultural diversity and those who devote their lives to, to, to creating it is not valued near zero, but rather finds an ethical and equitable place in this new and developing value chain. If you do this, if you support the world's music creators who ask only for fair and sustainable compensation, we will indeed enter a new golden age of culture and creativity that all the world's peoples can share. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eddie Schwartz. And what astonishing uh, figures those were. I mean, just to do the mathematics, $45,000 down to 0.0035 per stream. It's absolutely startling. And that is a snapshot of the situation in Senegal, India, North America, Israel, and France. I'm sure the same uh, could be said for uh, plenty of other countries as well. 
Um, France was the last on that list. France is where I live. And I re recently read a study by Panorama des Industries Culturelles et Créatives, uh, which gave the statistic that the creative sector is worth more than the auto sector. So there are billions of, jo uh, millions of jobs, billions of euros uh, that depend on this sector. Uh, so it deserves to be listened to. But let's start by uh, opening up uh, the panel, having a discussion amongst ourselves. You will have your chance to uh, join as well and raise questions. Uh, but let's get started amongst ourselves, looking at the topic, the title of the discussion, A Sustainable Future uh, for Authors. Uh, let's open it up. What do we think the priorities are in order uh, to make the sector sustainable? Who'd like to speak? <laughs> yeah, I can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think that what you heard uh, so far from this panel is that uh, we are all saying the same thing, even if we are painters or musicians or filmmakers or, or, uh, or graphic artists or whatever. Uh, I mean, the word sustainable is very important. Uh, you, you just mentioned it. Because actually, we are here all together to invent a sustainable de development for culture, a, a, an economy adapted to the 21st century. I mean, as I said, I mean, the, the, these I mean, big companies, broadcasters or, 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 or internet actors, they are not our enemies. They need us and we need them. And uh, uh, I would like to also clarify something. We are not here for whining. We are not considering us as victims. We were existing before electricity, we will exist after the internet. And, uh, but we need to organize for the next decades and for the, next, uh, for the future generations a decent and fair system for remunerating our work. And it's, we are not like a panel of dentists explaining to WIPO the problem of dentists, because it, we are not a niche. We, you are all concerned. In, in every family of yours or around you, you have one kid, one brother, one sister dreaming of becoming a photographer, a filmmaker, a musician. And today, he needs a job on the side to, uh, to get more than a pizza, as Eric was saying, or even a pizza. And, uh, and also, uh, also the, the fact that tomorrow will not have the next Picasso, the next uh, Michael Jackson, the next uh, uh, Michelangelo, or so far and so on. And uh, we all need this. This is, our, this is part of our soul. So we are here not for explaining that uh, we should uh, uh, fight against that broadcaster in India, that, uh, that actor in, on the internet, but, but trying to explain and con to convey the message to you all that we are virtual shareholders of these companies. They depend on the, our content. They depend on your content. They depend on the content of every creator potentially existing in every family of yours. So this is a, a real global problem. It's not, and it's not a global problem geographically, ge geographically also. And, and I would just like to uh, add something about your, your comment. Uh, about the fact that we, we talked uh, about uh, Africa. But you know, when we are talking about free access, there is a lot of things we should think about. And especially the fact that uh, when we are talking about sustainable economy, we should also think about sustainable economy for emerging countries. The fact that, for instance, uh, free access should be perceived by lots of creators and lots of people in Africa, for instance, uh, like uh, good news. But it's not necessarily good news, because it's a free access to what? To the culture of, the, of America and Europe, to uh, uh, the culture of rich countries, to the education patterns, instead of developing their own identity, their own creation, their own way of thinking and creating. And this is, is, this is what authors' rights uh, organization, organization can not only save, but can promote, can develop. This is why 
uh, the author's rights and, and intellectual property are one of the foundation of human rights. This is why we are in Geneva today. This is your duty, all of, you, all of you, all of us, to think about this like we were thinking about ecology 30 years ago. Thank you. Bernard, I think you wanted to say something as well. Uh, I would just like to add to what Julie said. Is that, uh, see, we in India, and especially the authors in India, have always believed that Bollywood films or Hindi television serials or any of the serials that we have produced is in today's time the new way of taking our culture and our storytelling patterns to the rest of the world. It is heartening to note that in Latin America and in Brazil there is a Portuguese series which is called something India which is actually based on uh, uh, Indian characters, Indian storytelling pattern, they wear Indian costumes, the sets are Indian, it's just that they speak Portuguese. Now this wouldn't have happened if we guys wouldn't have created the kind of television shows that we did. And it is beautiful and we are very happy about it. But the point remains that if Bollywood is what is the popular culture of India which is going all over the world today, we have authors and we have lyricists and songwriters and composers living in penury, abject poverty. In fact, it was pretty shameful, it was saddening that we had to actually bring one of our very poor and sad case of our music composer in parliament when the debate was happening to show to our lawmakers that this is what has happened to our songwriters. If, you don't, if they don't get the kind of remuneration and the kind of sustainability that we are talking about here. That gentleman was reduced to penury. One of our authors died without medical uh, aid. And who came to their rescue? No broadcaster, no producer. It was we authors who came together and we helped him. And we're very proud of it. We don't want to, as we've been talking about here, to come here to beg arms or, you know, uh, put our hands in front of you and say that, you know, help us. What we are trying to say here and what I would like to say here is that if all of you can't come together and help sustain authors and their rights, we will be depriving future generations of our own cultural traditions. Writing, music, art, sculpture is the culture of each country. And if the authors and the painters and the creators cannot sustain themselves, it is going to die off. That's all. Thank you. A question, of, a question of fairness there, it sounds, it sounds to me as though. And I'm going to uh, also intervene on this question of sustainability. Oui, je voulais... Uh... Justement. Ah. Ouais. Non, je voulais ajouter que nous, on a deux priorités justement pour avancer et faire évoluer rapidement euh, la situation des artistes. C'est d'abord la mise en place de la copie privée. Aujourd'hui en Afrique, la copie privée pour les pays comme le Burkina Faso qui applique la copie privée, elle rapporte 13 millions d'euros. Et si on appliquait partout la copie privée sur la base des taux d'Europe, elle rapporterait 240 millions d'euros, ce qui fait 157 milliards de francs CFA. Et ce qui est un, un, un chiffre assez énorme pour les auteurs, pour les créateurs, euh, pour les créateurs euh, africains. Et l'autre priorité, c'est la renégociation avec les diffuseurs sénégalais. Et pour ça, justement, l'État sénégalais, les autorités peuvent nous aider dans ce sens-là, parce qu'il faut renverser le rapport avec les diffuseurs. On n'a plus de salles de cinéma et les diffuseurs, c'est les télévisions et les, euh, les compagnies de téléphonie avec la, la VOD. Et... Euh, Ils ont le pouvoir parce que le créateur a son œuvre, mais il doit aller payer ce diffuseur-là pour qu'il montre son travail. En même temps, il faut qu'il montre ses œuvres. Donc, il est content qu'il y ait un diffuseur qui, qui peut montrer ses œuvres. Par exemple, nous, avec l'audiovisuel, le cinéma, pour qu'une télévision montre euh, mon travail, il faudrait que moi, j'aille trouver un sponsor qui me finance et que la télévision prenne 60% environ de ce sponsor-là et que moi, je prenne... Et, et du coup, après l'œuvre... Le peu de choses que je peux gagner me permet juste de payer les dettes que j'ai eues pour faire ce travail-là. Et au final, je pense que la télévision, les télévisions gagnent plus que les créateurs. Par exemple, il y a un, 
un grand euh, euh, groupe de téléphonie, euh, quand il met euh, l'œuvre en VOD, il récupère 70%, il vous donne 20% et les 10% qui restent, c'est pour ce qu'il doit reverser à l'État et des certains taxes et tout. Du coup, ils prennent quand même 80% sur, euh, sur les recettes et ne vous reversent que 20% qui suffisent à peine pour déjà payer ses dettes et en, en même temps pour vivre. Et on sait qu'en Afrique, une personne qui gagne un salaire... Euh, euh, on va dire correct, fait vivre une dizaine de personnes derrière, euh, derrière elle. Donc, euh, donc voilà un peu les deux, les deux grands axes qui vont être, en tout cas dans, dans le court terme, notre, euh, voilà, notre investissement. It certainly sounds like some countries are, are, are mobilized, some countries are, are getting mobilized. Uh, people are at different stages of, of, of the process uh, because after all, you creators uh, and creative people are, are your own defenders and if you don't defend yourself uh, it doesn't sound like uh, anyone else will j'aimerais rajouter sur le le droit de suite le resale right le resale right euh, pourquoi alors qu'il est appliqué en Europe que j'ai démontré on vient de démontrer que ça fonctionnait que ça n'atteignait pas le marché que c'était très bien redistribué euh, moi, en tant qu'artiste français et européen, je devrais être content et puis ça me suffit. Mais pourquoi on a besoin de vous ici pour que ce resale right devienne mondial C'est qu'il y a des déséquilibres qui se font. Par exemple, si une peinture, je vends une peinture dans, à, chez Christie's ou Sotheby's à New York, il n'y aura pas de droit de suite. Si un artiste, certains pays africains, vend ses peintures dans une maison de vente à Paris ou dans une galerie à Paris, il n'aura certainement, s'il n'est pas inscrit à la Société des droits d'auteur français, il n'aura pas. Donc, il y a un déséquilibre qui se crée entre artistes qui je trouve n'est pas, pas tenable et n'est pas équitable surtout. Donc euh, on a vraiment besoin que ce système de, de, de resale right soit, euh, soit acquis, euh, essaye d'être appliqué dans le monde entier. D'autre part, on s'aperçoit, vous avez remarqué, peut-être si vous regardez les médias français, que c'est la première fois pendant la Ve République, que le budget de la culture baisse. Alors, si le budget de la culture baisse en France, vous imaginez, on est déjà un des derniers pays à avoir un ministère de la Culture, parce qu'on s'aperçoit qu'au Portugal, c'est un secrétariat d'État, d'autres pays n'en ont pas du tout, je ne parle même pas des États-Unis et euh, des pays d'Asie. Euh, on s'aperçoit donc que les, que les fonds publics, les fonds publics qui viennent des taxes, des impôts, que les pays reçoivent, ne, sont de moins en moins redistribués pour la culture. Donc, si nous, les artistes, plasticiens, musiciens, etc., ne prenons pas euh, en main euh, le fait de récupérer euh, des sommes, que ce soit sur l'industrie numérique, sur le droit de revente des œuvres, euh, dans 20, 30 ans, 40 ans, euh, les subventions étatiques, moi je, je crois qu'elles n'existeront plus, puisque plus personne ne veut payer d'impôts aujourd'hui, donc si l'argent ne rentre pas, les États ne pourront pas redistribuer, et puis même aujourd'hui qu'on en paye, euh, ils ne redistribuent pas dans la culture, et comme je vous dis, c'est même en France, les, le, le, le ministère de la Culture diminue, je pense que dans 10-20 ans, on aura un secrétariat d'État, ce sera fini. Donc c'est à nous aujourd'hui, artistes, et aux sociétés de droit d'auteur, et à vous, représentants de tous, de tous les pays du monde, d'essayer de, de construire euh, des systèmes de redistribution pour aider les jeunes artistes, pour aider tous ces artistes dont je vous parle, qui sont des artistes parfois très fameux, qui ont eu ou un temps euh, où ils ont gagné beaucoup d'argent, par exemple, pendant un tout petit bout de temps, ou certains qui gagnent très peu tout le long de leur vie. Euh, il faut aider tous ces artistes, les artistes qui, qui vivent bien de leur art, il ne faut pas croire, c'est ce qu'on voit à la télévision, mais c'est une vraie minorité. Donc on a vraiment besoin, comme dans la musique d'ailleurs, on, on entale les grands noms, mais tous les, les artisans qui font ce que vous écoutez tous les jours, qui font ce que vous voyez tous les jours à la télévision, sur Internet, partout, ceux qui font le contenu de ces tablettes et iPhones, cela, il va falloir trouver, on est en train de trouver, je pense, un système pour essayer de redistribuer équitablement les quelques sous qui, je crois, ne feront pas défaut ni, à, ni au marché de l'art ni à l'industrie numérique. Merci. Hein. Uh, I just wanted to um, uh, speak for a moment about the collective management movement, um, which uh, I think is, has been an enormously empowering uh, event for many of us individual creators. I think the collectives themselves around the world, and let me preface what I'm about to say by saying I don't think the collective management movement is perfect, and I think that, uh, you know, it, 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 it does need uh, a little work here and there. Um, but I know that it's been under attack in many circles, and I've, I've uh, you know, had the opportunity to go to a number of conferences, and collective management always seems to be 
uh, somewhat under attack. So uh, to answer your question about sustainability, I think collectives have been, first of all, they're, they're one of the oldest, in fact, they probably are the oldest business model in, in the music business. Collectives have been around, I believe the first one in Paris was in around 1850. So we're talking about a business model that uh, certainly uh, predates uh, record labels and other of the institutions in the music business by maybe close to a century, certainly 70 or 80 years. Um, they, the, the licensing of rights, this idea that, of licensing of rights, I think is, is again, was, was an idea that was years ahead of, the, of, of physical distribution, putting things on trucks and selling them to people in stores. Uh, so collective management now, this far in, has a tremendous amount of experience in exactly what I think has become the world we live in, which is the licensing of rights. Uh, so I think that's a very important point. And, and, and last, and certainly not least, is that folks like, uh, you know, those of us who are individual, we're all sort of, you know, to some extent individual entrepreneurs. And we're all local entrepreneurs. I am not, I'm not a multinational company whose profits will flow back to New York or Los Angeles or Paris. Um, love those cities, all good, but uh, I'm, I, you know, lived in Canada most of my life. I now live in Nashville. I'm, the, the, the money, earnings that I make, and this is true of course, creators all around the world, come back to me in my local place of residence and I spend that money there. And I employ recording engineers and I employ recording studios and people who sweep the floors and catering services. So it, it's, we are locally based but we, but again, through the technology as we've mentioned, we now have this, all of us, and no matter where we come from, whether it's Africa or any of the countries of the world. So that the money flows back to us where we live and we spend it there. But collectives have been in a crucial point of empowering us to be able to reach a, a scale. If we don't collectivize our rights, there's certainly I think we understand from some of the companies we've, you know, the, the kind of multinationals we're dealing with, without collecting, cl collectivizing our rights, uh, we have absolutely no bargaining power. And we certainly never will get to that, I don't believe we'll ever get to that fair valuation uh, that we've all been talking about, which will, which will make creation sustainable. So I just would like to, I guess, uh, I think collectives are gonna have to be a very, very crucial point. Let me, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna have to end with one, Note, another reason why I think this is very important is because there are, are very, very uh, aggressive moves to dismantle collectives from even players within the music industry. Uh, I, I, some of you may have heard of this direct licensing issue, which has which now uh, become, as I said, quite important, particularly in the United States, where there are regulations that are not helpful. So um, it, it's very important that I think creators support their collectives. And, um, and, and work through them and assign their rights to collectives so they can operate on all of our behalf and for all of our benefit. Indeed. Um, Francis Gurry has, has joined us, the Director General of WIPO. Why don't you sit here in the middle? No, no, uh, you stay there. No, no, I would like no, you no, to no, sit no, no, here. Please, I think please, it's please. only right. No, 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 it's fine. You all right. stay there. Yeah, no, stay here. More time. This is the correct uh, way to put it. You know, <laughs> the creators in the middle, you know. You want me to say Please. Something? Okay. Um, so thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. First of all, I do apologize for not having been here uh, throughout the whole of this, but unfortunately I had another engagement with another group. Um, but uh, my thanks would go in the first place to all of those seated here uh, on the podium. We're really very grateful to you all for uh, making this effort and coming and uh, talking about such a very important subject. I would like to make perhaps uh, just one or two comments, if you would allow me, uh, at the end. And I'm sorry if I'm repeating what uh, you have already said. But I'll take up from uh, the last comment that was make, made, if I may, and say that I also would be very concerned that in the new economy, or however you want to call it, the digital environment, that there is an unhealthy concentration of value in the distribution function. So who's making the money here? Let's just uh, uh, put it in crude terms. Uh, well, the Googles, the Amazons, the, uh, all of the distributors are the ones. And up until now, the distributors have not really been investing in content production. 
the distributors. They haven't been investing in content production. Some of them are moving a little bit in that direction. Uh, nor do they actually connect people. You know, they don't uh, lay down the pipes. So um, Facebook uses incredible amounts of bandwidth, but it's not providing any bandwidth. So that's, I think, uh, one of the things that I would agree with you, if I may, uh, that we do have this incredible concentration of value in the distribution function, which should cause us to be concerned about uh, the future of content production or creators uh, more specifically. Uh, I suppose my second comment that I would like to make, and I, th I think it, it comes to some of the things that uh, I know you have been talking about, uh, but uh, I would say that uh, we've probably been through three broad phases uh, since the internet came on board. Uh, and the first was really the resistance phase, you know, that uh, creators really resisted the online environment. Uh, and the music interest industry was then on the front line, of course, because of bandwidth. You know, there wasn't sufficient bandwidth for anyone else to be on the front line. They were the only ones there. And then I, th I think the second phase that we saw was really provoked by Apple and, um, and uh, uh, iTunes. Uh, where they forced more or less everyone online. Um, but when that happened, uh, it happened really according to a model which was the same as the analog world. Namely, you owned a piece of content. Uh, and the third phase I think that we're now witnessing is a different phase where people tend not to own things but to have access to them. So access is, in a certain sense, replacing ownership, and thus the success of streaming models and subscription models that we've seen. Uh, and um, so I think we, uh, what we can learn from maybe the third phase is that uh, ease of access, uh, there's a certain amount of evidence to suggest that ease of access helps with compliance. I would not want to be understood as saying it replaces the need for enforcement frameworks. That's not what I said. Ease of access helps with compliance. I think if you ha and ease of access means accessibility and it means uh, relatively low cost. It means low cost and good business models, uh, as you were saying. So I think there's a certain amount of evidence to, from phase two and phase three to suggest that, that it is very useful to work on a functional global digital marketplace. Uh, uh, that will help us with the, uh, the compliance problem. It's not the only answer. You also have to have enforcement you know, framework to support the marketplace. Uh, so those would be my uh, few contributions. I'm sorry if I'm repeating anything anyone said, and I really apologize that uh, I wasn't uh, uh, able to be present and we're really grateful that this sort of an event takes place here uh, and we really look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you.